one of the things I'm curious about, so as you're in this and you're working with people and you're trying to help them go through this shift and changing and understanding, it's not simply just mindset, but it's all these other parameters. Like, what does that look like? How do you dive into, I guess the way that I would phrase it is, you know, how do you dive into the body memory first? What is the approach? Where do you step into emotional healing versus the mind? Where does conscientious work come into play in all of this? Well, I always combine, I do believe that first step is the self-awareness. So I always combine it with coaching. I, my goal is to teach a person to be an expert in who they are, not to just have a quantum hypnosis session, let's say, which I am absolutely blown um, uh, with the results from those sessions, from my personal life and my clients. These are my favorite type of sessions. But if we have a spontaneous change in remission, can the client replicate it? The answer is no, because they don't know what happened. So I always teach the clients to know what drives their life. I work with uh, a concept that I developed, uh, which I call uh, life scenarios. These are those scenarios that we unconsciously play out. Most of them are transgenerationally created, and we absorb them all without um, any analytical filtering, because it happened in childhood. And we did not have analytical filtering. So it goes right in and it, they become our life scripts, right? And I have eight of them that I work with for entrepreneurs and about 14, 15 of them overall. So this is a conscious thing. And then I combine it with the body memory. And for the, so the tools are very diverse. I've collected them for a few years now. Um, no, session is the same right but overall i believe that if we listen to the body and if we really trace and track our patterns and what happens in the body for example when we are as an entrepreneur on a sales call right i was terrified of sales and i thought i hated sales it was not the case but that's what i thought and this is what most people think right that trauma about money and all that state of unsafety makes us have either even aversion to money, or we judge, and we think consciously, oh, we want to become millionaires, right? But then we have so many unconscious blocks, and the body is terrified. That's why a lot of people think that they have fear of failure, but they have fear of success. They're literally terrified in their bodies and their neuro neurological system um, of that wealth and success and being known and being seen. So back to the tools, the body shows everything. But because the body holds that emotional charge. And if I use the language that both the body and the subconscious mind can understand, then, well, it gets released. And for example, when a client had problem with sales calls or with visibility, avoiding publishing a book, right? Procrastination, all of that, or avoiding reaching out. So they will have a client reach out to them, but they will drag and delay it that's self-sabotage because they know, well, if they respond, they will start getting clients, they will start being visible and that's dangerous for the body. And unless we release that perceived danger that lives in our body's memory, cellular memory and neurological memory and neurochemical memory, well, we're trying to willpower through. How do you help somebody identify that? And more so when they're with you and they're going through this process and you're bringing attention to this for them, how do you help them navigate it? Do you mind if I, uh, great questions. Thank you so much. Do you mind if I use an example of a particular Please. client? So for example, uh, working with a woman who is an entrepreneur, very driven. She has the purpose. She knows it. She thinks about it every waking moment of her life. She has tried all the mindset based modalities. In other words, she invested heavily and she understands that she needs to invest in herself to get results in terms of she needs that someone guiding her through the blind spots, right? So she's tried all the mindset work and the business strategy. And that's what a lot of entrepreneurs do. We get heavily invested in those uh, strategy and marketing tools instead of going to the root first. And then all the strategy and implementation becomes easy. Because otherwise, if the root is not resolved, we will be learning strategies and know all about it in theory, but will be resisting, right? So that was the case for her. And she thought she had an issue with that mindset. And when we started working together, 
we not from the first session because there are certain layers that have to be removed before that um, because healing is a structured process we cannot hit the skip steps or the psyche would not even allow um, us to get to that root uh, cause to that bottom right to so the real issue of the problem um, so i work that's why i work on a four-month basis right both with the coaching and the hypnotherapy combined so what we discover is that when she was young, she had a really traumatic episode with her family when they were quite well off and their financial situation changed drastically. They lost money. There was criminal activity involved. They, not only they lost everything, turns out she was scared for her life and her family's life. In her body, money and having wealth, being visible for that wealth, forever became associated. Yes, of course, in the limbic brain. Yes, of course, in the mind. But as a child, she spent sleepless nights being afraid that somebody is going to break into the house where they live and kill them all or take their family away no matter how much she tried to work with that conscious level and read the self-help books and know what millionaire mindset is, she wasn't hitting past that ceiling. She had the enough ceiling, right? She always had enough, but she could not break through to more because that means that in her body, it's equal to danger or death even, or loss. When we address that, everything changed. And then she started using all that strategy and all that marketing that she invested in. She knew what she was supposed to do. So now she combined it all and she went, you know, went off to create the success that she um, thought she wanted, but she was blocking all along. We'll be right back to the show, my friend, but I wanted to let you know about our brand new podcast community for Think Unbroken Podcast. I know that for so many trauma survivors like myself, for the longest time, I felt alone, like nobody got it, nobody understood, and that I was just going to have to figure this out on my own. But that's not true. And the reason why we created our brand new Think Unbroken Academy podcast community is so that we can bring all the members of the Unbroken Nation together in a place where we can learn, grow, heal, change, and transform our trauma into triumph. I would love to have you come and be a part of the brand new community. Just check out thinkunbrokenacademy.com or click the link in the podcast description. And I cannot wait to see you there, my friend. Again, just head over to thinkunbrokenacademy.com. And until then, be unbroken. What kind of activity is happening in the brain when this is transpiring? Because to me, I've always thought about this idea of mindset and controlling your thoughts and understanding now that it is conditioning, you know, I, I think I can look at that and go, well, of course that makes sense why when somebody does that thing, I have that response. But, but what is actually happening in the brain that drives that response? So, so we know that the brain stem, the autonomic nervous system, which I call the lizard brain, is the heart and soul of any Pavlovian conditioning, right? That's the, the part of the brain that, that hears the sound, uh, notices the sound, looks at the situation and the context. It depends on not just the sound, but where you are and who's doing it. Um, and, and it kind of, it has to, so it has to go up to the top brain, to the cerebrum and say, where am I? What's happening? What's expected? goes down into the motor, motor cortex and rumbles around and then it zaps the muscles. Now that's the physical reflex that people do not have, do not notice. So Michael, when you were a teenage, a kid and your brothers were chewing and brushing their teeth and making you so upset, did you notice that you were getting zapped or did you probably just notice you were getting upset? Yeah, it always felt like instantaneous. Upset, right? Like, yeah, just like a trigger. Okay, so what happens is the from the time a trigger stimulus starts, from the time you start hearing that crunch sound to the muscles firing wherever they are, and it's unique to every person, is about 200 milliseconds. And then, and then that's fed up into deep in the brain, there in the cerebrum, 
there is an anterior insula, and that's uh, the anterior insula cortex, the AIC, is a, a center for communication. So it gets all the external sensation and the internal sensation. So touch, taste, smell, sight, hearing, muscle tension, body temperature, oxygen level, pain, whatever. So it gets all the inside and ex internal and external. And that relays out to some spots behind your eyebrows, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is an emotional reflex learning center that takes something that's neutral and turns it into like a smell of grandma's house. Hey, I'm at grandma's house. Or misophonia, that crunch sound is like, oh, that's horrible. And so that little spot relays back to the anterior insula, which is, by the way, right next to the to the limbic system, to the amygdala and the hippocampus. And it just drives down, boom, 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 into the amygdala and hippocampus. And it's just ah, explosion of emotion. So probably by three tenths of a second from the time you first hear that trigger, your emotions are just flying. But they're emotional reflexes. And, it, and it's made that way to help you react quickly. This little structure behind your eyebrows, again, it takes something that's neutral, a, a, a person's face, and it becomes, hey, there's my girlfriend, or there's my wife for me, hey, there's my wife. And it creates a positive emotional reflex. So these things help us adapt to the world around us, help us respond quickly. And it's, it's great, it's, it's really good stuff. Are the what comes to mind is are these then individual experiences? Are we predispositioned to be biased in any way to certain stimulus? How I guess the thing I'm trying to wrap my head around in this moment is what exactly determines whether or not an individual have a reaction versus another one. Because okay. I know people listening right now are probably in this thing where like chewing food that never bothers me but if you click your pin i'm gonna throw you out the window <laughs> right right so, so is there a is there a cognitive bias here like how do the individual experiences play out in this so so there's a difference between a sound that you hear and a misophonia trigger because that's really a multi sensory experience you hear the trigger and then you're you're getting jabbed in your body somewhere so it's a little bit like fingernails on a chalkboard which is which is genetic not learned but people hear that screech and they go oh stop that i can't stand that sound and what they should be saying is oh stop that i don't like shivering because the the screech makes most people shiver and then they say i don't like that sound so with misophonia everybody who has misophonia has uniquely learned that their trigger responses. So for example, my wife developed a trigger to the chicken squawking because she was concerned that the neighbors would be bothered and that, that you know, she doesn't want to bother the neighbors. And so uh, she would hear the chicken squawking, not just clucking, but when they're all squawking at the same time, just right out of her, right in front of her desk, she faces her chicken uh, area. And uh, she would have that thought, oh no, I hope the neighbors are not bothered. And she would hold her breath. So after a while, when the chicken, the, the lizard brain saw that pattern and says, oh, Pam, I can do that for you. And now she hears the chicken squawk and her chest muscles go <coughs> and lock and she stops breathing. And then she has this, this ne very negative emotional response. Now the negative emotions are probably uh, ingrained as us as mammals that it's called pain induced aggression if somebody comes up and pops you in the back of the head you're you're immediately having this negative response and so any kind of aversive negative stimulus causes an irritation an anger or an aggression response so that part the fact that it all develops to anger is very common because we're mammals and it's our part of defending ourselves, but the individual sounds just depends on the person. So 
my wife developed it to the chicken squawking. Another man uh, that I worked with as a teenager, he had anxiety. He had shared a room with his brother who had allergies so he could hear his breathing. And he's laying there trying to go to sleep. And after 20, 30 minutes, he goes, oh, this is horrible. And he goes to the couch. But after that one night, every time he heard his brother breathe for the next 30 years, it triggered him. Hey, Unbroken Nation, we'll be right back to the show. But I wanted to let you know that you can grab a copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma, for free. If you go to book.thinkunbroken.com, you can download the PDF ebook version of the book and get everything that I know about the baseline of healing trauma for free downloaded to your email right now. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to download your copy of Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for a PDF for your phone. Again, that is book.thinkunbroken.com. One of the things I think is important and not necessarily just whether or not it's in therapy or prescription drugs or anything, but life in general is like trying to understand your core values when it comes to healing, yes. because I think, I think healing is all of these three elements that you talk about. How does one understand, you know, what it is that they know and what they're trying to understand about well, who they are and their core values? It's a great question. There's three stories that I believe we're always trying to negotiate. And this is what I've observed from working with patients, specifically cancer patients. There's three stories we're always trying to negotiate. And that's that story that of design, right? Laws of nature, things that are self-evident and speak to our natural affections. There's this story that says something inside of me wants to live, right? And we have an anatomy that bears witness of that. And then there's a story that we tell ourselves from our experiences in our soul, our mind, our heart, our will, our conscience, our feelings. There's that narrative we're always trying to negotiate. And then there's a story that we carry in our DNA. Our stories don't begin at home. They begin in the home of the home of the home of our parents' parents' parents. So three, four generations deep, there's a work of recall healing in Dr. Homer from German New Medicine expounded upon by Dr. Gilbert Renald, Recall Healing, that really speaks in powerful ways to that. So there's a story of that, of our very constitution, substantiated and well explained by laws of nature, things that are self-evident again and speak to our natural affection. There's the stories we tell ourselves from our experiences and the ideas and the thoughts that we got from our families of origin and our experiences. By the way, starting from conception, right? And in the womb and our first formative years of life and throughout. And then the stories of our anatomies. And I think reconciling those three stories is where we find incredible freedom. For example, with you, Michael, something in you knew intuitively that, oh, I don't know, this isn't right. So you used all kinds of means and methods, right? And resources to silence that, to mitigate that, to reconcile that. And they weren't productive. So at some point you decided, you know what? This is not for me. So I'm going to just bring an end to it all. And somehow, as providence would have it, you know, you weren't successful in that attempt. Call it whatever you want, divine intervention, chance, accident. I think it's because look what you're doing now. I think it was divine intervention personally. But then you have these, you have the reality of the heritage that you bring to bear and the legitimate experiences that you, that are in your tissue. The issues are always in the tissue, right? tissues and that, that are very real and the disparity between this hunger of your soul, this thing of what's happening in my life, right? That you're negotiating through these experiences you have and the trauma that you're bringing in from these generational patterns, right? The disparity between those things is where we find the anatomy of disease and addictions and all these things. So what happened at some point you reached bottom and I love how you address that. And you talk about the reaching rock bottom, 
that rock bottom is really a beautiful and wonderful and great place to be. And we were talking about this a little bit ago because there's nowhere else to go but up. If you can just accept that, hey, this is rock bottom for me, whatever that is for you individual or for a listening audience, if you can recognize, hey, there's only one other place I can go from here and that's up, right? Because I can't get any lower than this. We all have different margins, right? But then you begin to decide, you begin to choose, you begin to dig, you begin to learn, you begin to turn every stone, you begin to reach out. Like you were talking about earlier, looking for mentors, looking for information. We have the web now, we have the internet, we have YouTube, we have amazing resources at our disposal. We have amazing counseling, amazing podcasts to listen to. So there is no excuse why we have to give in to the disparity of whatever situation we find ourselves in. Nobody takes our life from us. We give it away. Yeah. And, and what I'm curious about, I have this thought, just this question just popped into mind. What do you think is the biggest misnomer or misconception that people have about their own mental health? That it's inherited that there's no way out without medication, that they're the victims of circumstances. I think the biggest, I think the most tragic bit of information that people believe are the lies of why they find themselves in the situations they find themselves. I think people don't realize how powerful they are. I think people do not understand that thoughts have power and words have authority. It's one thing to have thoughts that are limited, but it's another thing to begin to speak them into being. Words have power. Thoughts have power. Words have authority. We have to be very careful about the things we speak. We're better off asking questions, seeking information to get us out of situations that we find ourselves in than we are to get together with a friend over a beer or a glass of wine and continue to complain or we have very sophisticated ways of complaining, right? Fancy and sophisticated ways of complaining, but it's tragic because those would seem like nominal conversations or relatively insignificant, just shooting the breeze with somebody. They have devastating consequences in your entire constitution and in your life. You had an experience, anything like mine being dissociated and Absolutely. disassociated and, and kind of just having this outer body experience commonly. Um, I, I want to dive into that, but first, uh, as we kind of head into this, what was the moment in which you, st I think two things are going to be really important to have as a precursor to this conversation, Ken. One is talk to me about the thing in, in which ketamine made you curious. And mm -hmm. then two, what is ketamine? Okay. Um, first, I'll tell you what's ketamine and then I'll answer uh, how I became interested in it. So ketamine is actually an anesthetic, it's, you know, recognized as one of the broadly, most broadly used anesthetics. It's even used in, in veterinary medicine in the world. And so it's very important to um, keep it where it is and, you know, utilize it in a safe manner. So it was developed uh, because in World War II, our, our veterans on the battlefield were dying of morphine overdoses. Um, it was a standard dose, IM injection, meaning intramuscular injection through the pants. Um, in a, with someone who was, uh, of course, gravely injured on the battlefield. And that was causing respiratory depression. So the same thing that we're seeing now with deaths, with uh, opioid epidemic that we have in this country, we see deaths related to respiratory depression. Ketamine was developed so that we did, had a safer drug in the battlefield. And so it was called the buddy drug. Uh, ketamine increases heart rate, increases blood pressure, and it does not decrease respiratory or respiratory drive. And so very safe drug because it's an analgesic and, and does hit 
the opioid receptor, which so does morphine, but it hits a lot of other receptors. Um, so initially it was developed as an anesthetic and it is in its own class. It's again, it was described as a dissociative. So uh, what ketamine does is it basically allows your brain to drift off into the unconscious because you no longer have the sensation or the body sensory input that's coming to your brain. So you can literally perform, you know, small surgical procedures, uh, even in the field, you know, setting an arm uh, that's broken, shoulder that's uh, dislocated. So it's a lot, it's, and like I said, very safe drug used in ERs uh, uh, in pediatric hospitals. Um, and you could imagine in veterinary uh, medicine, you wouldn't want to have to control the airway of a giraffe or a horse or, you know, so that you want to keep them breathing. So most of the time when you see that shot, that's a dart that goes into a tiger, that's ketamine because it, it will sedate them safely and allow them to continue breathing. So that's kind of ketamine in a nutshell. Um, and then the connection for me is, of course, I'm familiar with it and the use of it uh, because it's so safe and being that it doesn't decrease heart rate or decrease blood pressure in the cardiac operating room, we need drugs that are cardiac safe. And that is a cardiac safe drug because of those things. And so if I have someone who's very ill from a, from a, a heart standpoint where their heart isn't pumping or squeezing uh, adequately, I can provide an anesthetic up front that will allow them to um, be anesthetized safely. Can you talk about the, the differentiation between ketamine in this um, medical practice styling versus what right. I am used to growing up on the streets being special K? Exactly. Um, so, I mean, in the operating room, we're mainly using it for uh, an anesthetic. And it's really, I mean, when you need an anesthetic, you need analgesia, you need amnesia or amnestic where you don't remember things. And you also need it in a dose where it's going to be again safe. And so just like many of the drugs, fentanyl is a drug that's used in the operating room. It does make its way to the street and it's used illicitly. Um, but, you know, it also is, can be brought back into look at, looking at it as a therapeutic way of being able to help patients in other ways. And so back in the 90s, they began to recognize, again, in the military, uh, that in the burn unit, uh, soldiers who were having debridements when they're burned, they have to go through multiple different uh, operations, essentially, where they're having this excess burned skin taken from their body. There were a group of uh, patients that were receiving a drug called propofol. You may be familiar with that, with Michael Jackson. Um, there's an, the other patients were being uh, anesthetized with ketamine and they would come out of these experiences, reliving some of their traumas in the battlefield and being able to process them. And so that began the thought that, wow, these, these guys are having less you know, PTSD long-term, maybe there's something that we can look at here. And so it began a process of where we started to utilize um, uh, many different modes, I mean, you know, I won't go into, into detail of the studies, but essentially utilizing ketamine as a dissociative, you use that term dissociation. This is a dissociative drug, meaning that it allows you to escape the input of your body and so that you're just basically free to roam your unconscious. We'll be right back to the show, my friend, but I wanted to let you know about our brand new podcast community for Think Unbroken Podcast. I know that for so many trauma survivors like myself, for the longest time, I felt alone, like nobody got it, nobody understood, and that I was just going to have to figure this out on my own. But that's not true. And the reason why we created our brand new Think Unbroken Academy podcast community is so that we can bring all the members of the Unbroken Nation together in a place where we can 
can learn, grow, heal, change, and transform our trauma into triumph. I would love to have you come and be a part of the brand new community. Just check out thinkunbrokenacademy.com or click the link in the podcast description. And I cannot wait to see you there, my friend. Again, just head over to thinkunbrokenacademy.com. And until then, be unbroken. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review. And you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken.